friends, Uncle Marv here with another episode of my unhealthy podcast, the show where we talk about health and wellness from a different point of view. We talk about all the things that we can change, whether they're habits, relationships, or what we do with our food. And we are going back with another episode. I'm bringing back my friend Julie that you've met on a couple of earlier episodes talking about microdosing, and I have been doing a huge deep dive since those first two episodes. And what we're going to do today is we're going to try a little experiment. I am going to see if I can teach Julie about microdosing and see if what I've learned is correct. Well, that's probably not the right way to say it. There's there's levels of of microdosing. So that's probably not the right way, but to see if at least I understand it correctly. And we're going to answer an email that I did get about this from one of the earlier episodes and we'll see where it goes. But for now, Julie, welcome back. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Really looking forward. I feel like this is putting me to the test of am I a good explainer? Am I a good teacher? And we'll find out today. Yes, we will. So let's do this first. Let's get the email out of the way only because I I did do a little response and I won't say who the person was, but I will simply read the question as it is because I'm sure that a lot of my listeners were probably thinking the same thing but just did not say it. And the question is, hello, Uncle Marv. I love your show. However, I am wondering for the life of me why – Of all people, you would be doing a show about microdosing. It seems a bit far from what you normally do, and I don't actually ever see you doing it. So that was was the email. Well, there was more to it, but that was the part we're going to respond to today. And uh, I'll tell Julie, I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to my response, but basically I said, look, it is – uh, something that I'm willing to talk about because it does fall into this realm of the unhealthy podcast. Uh, I've always said that this show is going to be more than just diet and exercise. We're going to talk about all the things that, you know, make us unhealthy that we can change, whether it is, you know, food, diet, exercise, relationships, money habits. Uh, we've talked to somebody about imposter syndrome. So mindset is a big part of this. And microdosing is just one of those things. Now, I will answer the question about whether or not you see me doing it. And, of course, the short answer is right now, no. I've never done it. I've never done actually any drugs. I I made fun of smoking a cigarette when I was very little, and my mom made me smoke one just so that I knew what it tasted like. And I said, ooh, never again with that. Uh I drink every now and then, not very much. And I get made fun of a lot for people that are like, you're only having one? Wait a minute. Are you going to finish the second one? Come on now. And that's it. I I will not do that. So yes, microdosing is a little bit out of my realm. However, there's a lot of things changing in the world and it might show up there one day. So Julie, I'm sure you get a lot of people that, you know, say to you, you know, What in the world are you doing microdosing? Yeah, I mean, I'm from a small town in Iowa. And um, as I shared, I used to be a lawyer. So I certainly receive a lot of feedback. Um, I even receive feedback from my mom. I definitely think there are other things she wishes that I were doing. And um, just like with anything, I don't believe there is a one size fits all solution to any sort of issue. So I'm, I'm not out here proselytizing as if I think everyone needs to convert to the world of microdosing. I don't. Um, my goals are to be informative or to be clear. And when I connect with anyone who wants to microdose, we always have a long conversation first. And I have several times said, I actually don't know if I think this is the right thing for you. I have recommended people to therapists. I've said, you know, like we talked briefly about on um, other shows that, you know, if you're someone who experiences psychosis or schizophrenia, probably not the thing for you. So um, I, I'm not trying to shove mushrooms down anyone's throat. My goal is simply to be uh, 
an advocate for accurate information and to make sure that people have guidance. I'm a huge, my number one word has and always will be integration. And I simply want to make sure that people are doing this in an intentional, safe way in order to really see the benefits they want to see and to make sure that those effects last. All right. Well, I do want to talk a little bit more about your coaching. We started to talk about that in our last episode last week. But uh, before we do that, let me see if I can, what's the best word, uh, impart upon you the knowledge that I have gleaned in microdosing. Okay. Uh, so for the most part, the first thing that I had to to learn was truly what microdosing is because the first thought, as soon as you say mushrooms, or I guess the, the correct term is magic mushrooms, which the the scientific name for that is psilocybin, which is the ingredient. And the confusion is because there are people out there that are treating this like a recreational drug. And they're doing doses that are large enough to have a trip. But microdosing itself is not that. It, if somebody is doing microdosing the correct way, they are not going to have any of those inhibiting benefits. It's, that's benefits isn't the right word, uh, but they're not going to have a trip. They're not going to feel impaired. But what microdosing can do is give somebody, you know, improved focus, help their mood, reduce anxiety, but not in the same way that a lot of the prescribed big pharma drugs can do where they actually do affect your mood. And, you know, the ones, I mean, my nephew is on some drugs. He is uh, on the spectrum and, you know, given some drugs to kind of calm him down and stuff. And, and they certainly do have a mood affecting um, result, but microdosing properly does not do that. The other thing is, of course, most areas, at least uh, 48 states, microdosing technically is illegal, but it's it's not necessarily the microdosing. It's the fact that the uh, – what is it? The manufacturing and selling of what they call those narcotic um, – was it Schedule One narcotics is illegal. And for whatever reason – Mushrooms got stuck into that category, even though they're not the same as any of those other drugs that really are like heroin, cocaine, uh, stuff like that. Now, you know what? I did not bring my notes and I'm trying to remember. So you had mentioned that mushrooms were kind of studied in the 1950s and for a long period of time, they were studied for this very reason that a lot of people use them to talk about improving mental health, mood enhancement. And somehow in one of the presidential elections, it became one of those political uh, things that, you know, you had to pick a side, you know, good versus evil. And if you're going to take any of these, you're evil. And that's kind of where that started. Then it turned into the war on drugs, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, that's what it is. But in its purest form, microdosing is, I don't know, the... I, I want to call it self-medicating if done properly where you don't have to go to big pharma and get the prescription and, you know, worry about whether or not your insurance will cover it. But let me, let me say this to you as well, because I kind of think there's three camps and you can tell me if this is right. So of course there's the one camp where there are a lot of people out right now treating it like a recreational drug whether it's, you know, tech CEOs right now, it's a big popular thing in Silicon Valley where they're just doing it because they hear other successful people doing it. And, you know, that's the way to go. There is the health and wellness camp, more specifically the healing camp, where they are treating this like, look, if you are having bad experiences with the other drugs out there that are being prescribed, this is a safe and effective way to possibly gain the same results. 
And then the third camp, I think, is more of your, and I don't know where to put them, your tree hugger, naturalist type people where they just want to get a better experience with the world, connect with nature, and enhance their experience. So that's kind of my summary on microdosing. How did I do? First of all, I feel like we had a very productive, we've had very productive conversations because uh, really everything that you mentioned, I felt like, okay, we, we have really come to an understanding. Uh, there was correct information conveyed. Um, so there were just a couple of things I was jotting down while uh, you were reciting. Okay. And um, so you totally nailed it. Psilocybin is the compound is the thing that will create sort of the effects in our brains. And when we think about magic mushrooms, those are all called psilocybes. So there are different strains of mushrooms that you hear about, like Jack Frost, um, Golden Teachers. These are all different strains of magic mushrooms, but they're all also called psilocybes. So I thought I'd throw that in okay. as well because I correctly identify that psilocybin is the active molecule. And then I just briefly wanted to touch on what you spoke to uh, when it came to medication and mood. And I can only speak from my personal experience, but I will say I was on Prozac at one time when I was trying to deal with my mental health stuff. And what I felt when I was on Prozac was essentially that I had kind of, it removes you from the spectrum of emotional experience, I'll say. I felt very flat and sort of like a zombie, but I, I actually almost needed it at that point because I was having such high highs and low lows. So it kind of evened me out. But eventually I realized I'm not having any sort of emotional experience, good, bad, or otherwise. And so what I like about uh, microdosing with psilocybin is that it it enhances mood um, in a more positive way. It allows for like a more, um, a less oppressive feeling than a Prozac. And it helps regulate you without removing you from any experience at all, right? So if we're thinking about things as a wave and the crests and the peaks are very high for people who are experiencing emotional distress, Prozac will kind of flatline you and microdosing can help you maintain a wave-like pattern, but without such high highs and low lows. And so that's why I really think it's such a benefit because people want to have a full range of emotional experience. That's what we're here to do. It's a gift of being alive. We don't want to completely take ourselves out of the game, but we want it to feel more manageable. Um, and then the last point that I really liked when we were talking is, you know, there we were discussing the different camps, which I really think you nailed. And there was this um, idea of like self-medication of, you know, maybe not liking big pharma, big pharma is too expensive. And, and when it comes to this idea of self-medication, I actually like to think about it as um, getting you to a really good baseline, right? So I know we've talked about this gym analogy a lot, but let's say you're fresh to the workout game, fresh to the nutrition game, you know, movement's important, you know, you could clean up your diet, but you're not sure where to begin. So you start and you go to the gym, you hire a trainer and you hire a nutritionist and they help you learn, get on track. And eventually the goal is to get to the point where you no longer need those people like you can confidently go to the gym you can take yourself through a workout regimen you can maintain a healthy weight and strength um, and you can feed yourself properly that's my goal and what i do it's to get you to the point where you don't need to continue to self-medicate so by the end of working together my goal is that you have reached a really strong baseline that you can maintain and you can take the tools and you don't need to continue to microdose because what's different about microdosing versus something like again i'm just going to speak from what i used to be on prozac Prozac, you know, yes, people titrate off, but what happened to me and what happens to so many is I titrated off and I actually was below my baseline. I felt worse than when I started versus microdosing. It's totally safe to stop at any point and all the gains that you earn during our process together, you maintain, and then maybe you just microdose once or twice a year for maintenance after that. So it's a much more sustainable process than being on a medication that you might have to be on for the rest of your life. So one of the things that I did not see anywhere or hear anywhere is the addictive part of it that there um, – I think you mentioned in our first show that you know it's not something where you have to increase the dosage to get the same result, you know, whereas with other drugs, you know, to get that same high, yeah, you got to keep doing it. You got to get your fix. You know, cyber, um I just – psilocybin. Did I just, well, how did I just mess that up? Uh, doesn't have that same effect. 
Yeah. So um, that's a great point. Uh, psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin are the only schedule one drugs. Um, I could not think of that phrase in an earlier episode from a few weeks ago. And I was just kicking myself, but it was one of those things I was having, you know, my brain was totally blank. It was a fresh slate, but of all the schedule one drugs, psilocybin and LSD are the only non-addictive um, substances there. And actually in studies with like rats um, where they give rats little bits of cocaine or heroin or little magic mushrooms, rats will not go back to those substances. Substances. So there's actually zero risk of habit forming. Um, I do think there's a certain risk of maybe people using it as a crutch, thinking like they need to keep doing it. But actually, that's not true. And my my largest focus in my work is making sure people have systems, structures, new mindsets, everything in their life in place so that they can very confidently stop microdosing, maybe come back to it once or twice a year for maintenance and just have a better overall quality of life. Now, I heard somewhere that somebody was trying to make psilocybin feel more like a supplement than a drug. And that drug is probably the wrong area that we put it in and that it's really more of a supplement. What do you think about that? I mean, I completely agree with that because, again, like it's such a mis uh, classification in my mind to put it in schedule one, even just given the FDA guidelines, the guidelines are that it is um, toxic, meaning it can kill you. Like if there's a high likelihood that it could kill you and that it has no known medical use or property. And both of those things aren't true as we've discussed. Um, and I do think of it as more of a supplement. And in fact, you know, the companies that I work with, that's how it comes. It looks like a vitamin supplement. It's ground up dried mushrooms, the psilocybes, but also then functional mushrooms. So those are non-psychoactive mushrooms like lion's mane, reishi, cordyceps, all things that we like, they're kind of buzz things right now, you know, especially out here in California where you always hear about adaptogens and mushrooms and everyone wants to put them in their coffee and things. In coffee? Yes. Um, so there's one type of mushroom, chaga, and it's very common that they'll make some sort of like fun cold brew coffee drink with chaga in it. And it's actually quite delicious. You, As you might imagine, I will pretty much, if something says it has a mushroom in it, I'll try it. Okay. All right. I'm going to make a note here. I want to go back and ask you about all the different ways to try mushrooms because that sounds interesting because coffee is already a stimulant. Why would you want to throw something in there to enhance it? So functional mushrooms have different properties. Um, you know, one of the most popular functional mushrooms we hear about a lot, especially in a post um, COVID world, or we're still continuing to deal with COVID, but once the rise of COVID happened and people had long haul and they experienced a lot of brain fog, um, Lion's mane is a great functional mushroom that in particular helps us create more of that clarity and presence and clear up the brain fog. I know uh, I had a, you know, back first wave and I did experience that afterwards of thinking like my brain, something's off. Like I've always thought I was very good at math. Um, and tests would say I'm very good at math, but I could not do like arithmetic in my head. And so I started uh, taking lion's mane pretty religiously as a tincture. Um, and it really helped me clear up that brain fog that was lingering. So there are different, each mushroom, functional mushroom has a different property. Um, I actually don't know specifically the benefits of chaga, but it's quite amazing what different mushrooms can do. And I don't think it's necessarily a stimulant for chaga. I think there's something else that it's supposed to give you. Okay. Very interesting. See, now I do have a reason to ask you to come back on the show, just so I can hear what all the different strains are. Um, all right. So let me see. So we talked about that. We talked about the three groups. Now, let me ask this, because I think the one question that will always come up is the people that are using this recreationally. I know that you had talked about the fact that in your, your coaching, you don't sell and you have, you know, a place where you can refer people to. I know that when I was uh, looking stuff up, I guess the idea of sourcing psilocybin from you know legitimate places versus growing them yourselves. Apparently, there's these uh, what do they call pods you, you can get to grow them yourselves. How legit is that? Um, 
Okay, well, so first of all, there's a lot of concerns that I have when it comes to people growing them themselves, mostly because mushrooms are a very temperamental thing to grow. So the companies that I do refer people to are, you know, real companies with facilities, they're temperature controlled, they're light controlled. So mushrooms, you know, they need to have right temperature, right light. And as people know, it's easy to... um you know, mistake, for instance, uh, a good mushroom that you can eat for a poisonous mushroom. And it's also easy to mess up the mushroom process and create something that could like cause you sickness. I'm not saying it's going to kill you, but it could, you know, cause you tummy upset or something. Um, So I just caution people, if you don't like have some sort of understanding of, um, you know, cultivating any sort of food source for yourself, I would maybe be wary. Um, But then you also need to know, you know, what sort of actual starter are you getting? And I, I personally, um, one of the companies that I work with does have like starter kits for people. And I know that they're very legitimate and they come from a good starter source and it's not that hard to get going. But I think a lot of people think, oh, I can just, you know, get some dirt and a light and make a mushroom in my closet and then I'm going to have a magic mushroom or a psilocybin. It's going to be great. And I just, um, I think people really uh, underestimate the difficulty of growing a safe effective mushroom. It's not like you just go get a plant from Lowe's and, you know, it blooms in your yard. So definitely a concern that I have for people. Okay. So I did hear of somebody that said that they did mushrooms. Now I don't know how much we can verify whether they were legit mushrooms or not, but uh, she talked about getting an upset stomach through her dosing thing. So even though people are not supposed to feel a trip, are there, I I don't think I've been asked you before, are there physical things like that upset tummy that this person said she experienced? And so she, again, claimed to be microdosing. Just want to clarify. That's what she claimed, but I don't know. So I will say for the first, um, few doses, there might be like a little bit of an adjustment period for your body. So, um, I think people have this idea that I personally am on mushrooms all the time. I'm not. I finished up a microdosing regimen about a month ago, and uh, I'm taking a nice long break. I don't personally feel the need to go on another microdosing protocol right now. I only do it when I feel like there's something new I want to test out in my business or I am seeking some like personal healing and growth on my own. And so uh, that being said, when I do start up again for the first three or so days that I'm on or actively taking the capsule, I do experience like, I wouldn't say stomach upset, like I don't have a desire to like vomit, um, but I'm like a little bit nauseous. So maybe I'll take it with food. And that's just sort of an adjustment period for your body. I know a couple of people the first few days have reported having like a slight headache. So it's sort of just like any new medication. I mean, when I first started going on Prozac, I was like, I definitely didn't feel good. Or for instance, even taking an iron supplement, I just cannot do it unless I eat a full meal with it. It'll really upset my stomach. So I think that's a pretty normal thing just in the world of medication and supplements of your body needing a little time to adjust. But I've heard of people and, you know, I sometimes I facilitate at a larger dose as well in Colorado, um, one of our two legal states. And so then yes, like that's very common at a larger dose for people to experience uh, like actual nausea. But to me at a micro dose, I've never heard of someone like actually getting ill. And I personally have nausea a little bit, like a little discomfort, but not I'm sick to my stomach. All right. So no more than any other medication that you might take. If you take it on an empty stomach, you might feel a little queasy and stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. So anything else in what I was describing back to you that uh, you might want to tweak? Um, no, those are really the big points that, um, yeah, I think we really nailed it. And I like how we talked about three different camps. And, you know, in my mind, those camps are just like people who don't like their medication, want to get off of it, or maybe, you know, are not into medication to begin with, but are looking for like that healing, anxiety, mental health um, support, the people who are looking to have a more purely recreational experience. And those people who are my favorite word optimizers. I, you know, I think we talked about this 
before that our brains are really designed to execute, but not to optimize processes. Um, and I love reaching that sort of like our brain is such an awesome supercomputer, right? And we can reprogram it. Our default programming is pretty good. Like, look how far we've gotten in advancements in technology. Um, and I really believe there's like a new layer that we can unlock more parts of our brain that we can turn on and activate and have communicate with each other to see how expansive this consciousness can really get. Okay. So let's talk more about your coaching. I know we kind of hint at it every now and then. And let me first start with this and then we'll we'll proceed on. If, let's say, for instance, me got to the point where I said, you know what? I think I want to try this. Now, from my perspective, you know, I'm not somebody that I don't have any medical or mental issues that I know of. I don't see myself having depression or anything, but I may be one of I want to, you know, increase my cognitive ability. I want to, you know, you know, I've run my business for 27 years. I, I think I might be hitting a wall or something. Um, I hear of other successful people doing this and I'm thinking maybe I can do this and, you know, regain that edge or something. If I were to come to you, how would you chat with me? Yeah, so first we start off in a pretty low stakes conversation, um, not like the one we're having now, where I would simply ask you, there are certain questions I ask um, to help me learn more about the person and what they're looking to gain from it and where they're currently, where they currently are. Um, I think one of my biggest gifts is I like to call myself a blind spotter. Um, I'm really good at identifying someone's gap and supporting them and closing it. So the conversation doesn't like, there's not a set number of questions that I ask someone. It really, I like to follow what people are saying and, you know, underneath a wall or the wall itself isn't usually what people think it is. So we would identify like what's really in your wall and what's stopping you or, or where would you like to pivot or, you know, find a way through. And um, from there, I'd also ask you several questions about your own mental health history, your family history, if you were on any medications, not because I'm a nosy Nelly, but simply like there are contraindications that I'm very mindful of. Um, I would explain more about my program, how it works to you, um, and make sure that they're all like the big focuses, areas of focus in my program are things that you personally align with and understand. I'd ask you a few questions to make sure that you're a good fit for the community because there is a community aspect to the work that I do. And from there, you know, we'd get you started. Okay. And we'll just ask these questions in a, in a random way. In terms of coaching, what is a typical coaching experience? Is it, you know, a one-on-one? -on -one? Is it a group? Is there a program? So I have my program that I always run, but there are a limited amount of spots. So it's roll in, roll out. You know, as someone rolls out, there's a spot for someone to roll in. And I keep it at a certain number of spots so that I can make sure that everyone has the same access to me, opportunity to be supported. I'm not shortchanging anyone by having too many people in my program. And so I'll come back to this program. But that is definitely the most common way that I work with people. Um, and it's very, at this point, you know, I've been in this business three years, it's very streamlined in terms of I really know what works and what people need. So I like to say it's everything that you need and nothing you don't. Because I've definitely been in programs where you have, you know, over a hundred modules of videos and things. It's like, I'm never going to look at all that. Why don't you just highlight the ones that are most important? Tell me to go to those and I'll make sure that I watch them. Um, and then I also work with people one-on-one. -on -one. That's definitely the most high touch um process that I have. And that's for people who are um, really looking to, I'll say, make uh, some really, really, really big jumps. And they know they work best in a one-on-one -on -one container and they want that high touch and very customized processes, right? So I have a process that I really, I know believe, I know works for most people, but sometimes people are like, I want you to fine tune everything to me. So, you know, right now I'm working with um, this man who's an engineer, a systems engineer, and we're in the one-on-one -on -one space together where we, he's still microdosing, but, you know, every week is uh, totally his own concoction based on exactly what he needs. Um, in any sort of space that I work with people, you do have the opportunity to speak with me directly and ask questions. So in my program, 
there is an entire course already built out that you can access with those videos, the worksheets, all the downloadable resources, everything that you need and nothing you don't. And then every week it alternates between having a small group call with just a few other people asking questions, receiving feedback, getting coaching, and then one-on-one calls with everyone checking in. That's usually where people tell me, you know, more, I'll say traumatic things that have happened to them. They open up, they share a little bit more freely than they would in the group call. And I support them in a, you know, one-on-one specialized way in that space. But then in between, they can message me and receive support. Um, And every, you know, month as they come in and out of protocols, we might talk about changing the schedule they're doing, or um, I might recommend some additional supplements, right? Like, oh, make sure you take your magnesium, things that, you know, aren't, no other sort of uh, psychedelic substance, but perhaps that lion's mane, like functional mushrooms, uh, magnesium, vitamin D. So it's all a very customized process. And I work with people very um, intimately, regardless of whether or not you're in my group program or you're in one-on-one. But that's also such an important reason for me that we have a very thorough conversation before we ever jump in because, you know, I'm very conscious of who am I working with? Am I really going to be best of service to you? And are you a good addition to the group? All right. Now, are you still doing any of the regular coaching where, you know, people are just coming to you for the leadership stuff and not talking about microdosing or is that microdosing now, you know, the main part of your coaching? Um, So the engineer I was thinking of before, um, he actually came to me just for traditional, um, you know, leadership communication uh, executive coaching. He was a referral. And so, you know, from someone who I had worked with previously when I was just doing that. And so I'm totally open in one-on-one spaces to do things like that. He eventually really wanted to try, uh, the microdosing. He said, just from seeing everything I say about it online and he's like, okay, let's give this a shot. Let's add this in. But, um, yes, if you, if that's what you're looking for, the only space that I do that in is one-to-one. I don't have anything like a group program or something available for people who aren't looking to microdose. Um, but that's totally an option. I, you know, I don't make anyone microdose, but we do it in the one-to-one space. All right. And to be clear, you don't uh, allow for people that just want to come in just because they're curious. Hey, let me check this out and see what's up. No, because I do only have a set number of spaces, right? And so I really want to make sure someone is like, this is what I want to do. And truthfully, it would feel disrespectful on both ends. Like, I I totally understand the curiosity. And if people want to ask me questions, I'm always happy to answer them. But I only have so many spaces. So I want people who know they're committed, they want to come in, they're ready to do the work. Um, I've had people within the group coaching who have not microdosed all four rounds, right? They've microdosed once, they've taken a longer break in between and then microdosed again. So I'm, I'm not set on the, you have to go through it four times. There is an opportunity to go through it four times. So I tell everyone that, but I totally respect someone's process. If they feel like they got what they needed out of one or two times and are just then looking to come into it to receive the weekly coaching and support and not have the microdosing be a piece of it. That's totally fine. But if you're like, I don't really know if I want to do this. I just want to check it out. Happy to have a conversation. But the spots in my program are for people who are really ready to come in and make a change. All right. And the community aspect, is is that something where once somebody has gone through the four rounds, do they kind of stick around? And, you know, is it one of those groups where everybody can kind of communicate with each other and, you know, you know, pick each other up and give each other motivation, that sort of thing? So one reason I love to keep it small, besides the fact that that helps me be a best of service to everyone, it also helps the group actually connect. So I've been in um, a community where there's like almost 300 people. So, you know, I see people's comments on different threads and things. And I'm thinking like, I have no idea who this is, you know, Um, no, no, like emotional connection to them. But the women inside of my group are all very connected because there's only 10 of them at a time. Um, And so in that way, yes, I take people out once they're no longer in uh, like the program anymore, because that's also where people receive support. So, you know, your support lasts for the six months. Uh, Um, So, but once, you know, once you've completed, I do remove them from the group, but like they're very connected. They're all following each other on Instagram. Like some of them have met up because I have this interesting little thing or I had it about, six months ago where 
four different women all happen to be from Connecticut. And I don't know how it happened, but they met up with each other. So um, there are real connections. But that's a huge reason that people want to join my program in particular. It's because they feel very isolated. They feel very like people don't understand them. They're going through a tough time. A lot of them are moms and they're just struggling and in motherhood and feeling so depleted. And so I really love seeing them cheer each other on. And there definitely is that aspect where people will post a comment, you know, kind of having a tough day or even in the small group calls where one woman, I can remember this is maybe at the beginning of the year, one woman had joined the group about a month before this other woman. So the other woman was new and she was like, this is a little bit tougher than I thought it was going to be. A lot of emotions are coming up. I don't know. And so this other woman who was a month ahead of her was like, you got this. It gets so much better. Like, wait for your breakthrough. It will continue. And I think, you know, it's one thing for me to say it. Of course, I'm going to say that to you. Yes, I believe that it's true. But that's also my job is to be your cheerleader and your motivator and to, um, you know, just hold you to your highest standard for yourself. But it's a different thing when this woman who is simply in a group with you is like, it's amazing. Keep going. And so I love that the group aspect provides for some like social proof for the women, especially when they're having a hard time. All right. So I had a question. Um, I think I'll ask you off air about that question, but the whole mom thing popped up and just to tweak your interest, it revolves around a glass of wine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. Uh, okay. but but folks, uh, juliesavone.com and at juliesavone Instagram is probably where you'll get more activity there. You'll see uh, a lot of her stuff there, the microdosing transformation and her I'm, – I'm reading right now myself. <laughs> says, oh, I was like, what do you see? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm looking at your Instagram page and um, on the verge of burnout, microdose. Got a, is, that a, is that you sitting there in the picture with the pose? It's like the, oh yeah, definitely. They're all they're all me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you're interested in microdosing, uh, reach out and. Uh, oh, I was going to ask you this: How many people come to you already fully understanding microdosing? That's a great question. I don't think anyone. Well. I guess I want to caveat this answer. I've spent so many hours microdose, like researching microdosing and learning about it, right? So I don't think anyone I've ever worked with has obviously the same understanding that I do, which is kind of the point, right? We don't seek to learn from people who know as much as us, but like fully understanding. I don't think I've ever worked with someone who really understands like at the onset, right? The full importance of being guided and being intentional and pairing it with certain things like meditation, hypnosis, things we've talked about. Um, But I would say it's about, I've never also worked with someone who has no idea what microdosing is or has never heard the term before. I mostly work with people who have heard about it. um, And lots of them are very similar to you of like, I have never done any sort of drug. This feels scary, but I've heard about this and I'm really looking for something. I feel like nothing has worked for me and I'm open to trying it. And so for them, it's a lot of, you know, assuaging any fears, dispelling any misconceptions, uh, making them feel comfortable. And then an, another portion are people who like definitely understand it um, to a basic degree and are looking to do it. And I don't really like this where I don't believe that, you know, I'm right and you're wrong or anything like that, but doing it the right way, you know, in a way that's going to help them really make a change that isn't just like recreational or isn't like thinking I'm just taking an Advil and then my headache's going to go away. It is not like that. (laughs) You can't just pop the pill. And it's people who understand that. Okay. So there's no circuit of microdosing where people go from coach to coach. (laughs) Oh gosh. I don't think so. And you know, what's so interesting is I'll say, I feel like I'm pretty different in this space. I don't think everyone's like this, but I do think a lot of people in the psychedelic space, like microdosing coaches are much more hmm, what people traditionally think of as someone who does a lot of mushrooms, <laughs> you know, okay. and um, people, the people that I work with are like, that's not exactly what I didn't want. That doesn't feel approachable. Like, I don't feel like I could talk to that person. You just seem like a very normal girl who this is what she does. And, you know, people hear that I used to be a lawyer and they're like, okay, this seems a little bit more reasonable for me, right? I'm, I'm not everyone's cup of tea, but for those people who know that that is not what they're looking for, I'm definitely that person's person. All right. 
Well, you've heard the story, folks. This is our third episode with Julie, and I will ask her to come back. It'll be a little bit of time, and uh, I'll come up with some questions. We'll talk about uh, talk about some of these strains, and because it sounds like you can kind of target what you do with mushrooms, but we'll see. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to any future conversations. And thank you so much for everyone listening who came into this thinking, what the heck is microdosing? And just had an open mind and was open to simply hearing something new. All right. Thank you much, folks. That'll do it. Uh, check out the unhealthypodcast.com or sign up to follow any of your favorite podcatchers to hear when future shows will be released. That's going to do it. We will talk to you later. Holla.